Welcome, everyone, to my town hall on solving the climate crisis. I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. I'm delighted that you were joining me for what I hope is going to be a very informative and interesting conversation. And joining me for that, I, I could not ask for two better expert guests. I'm going to be joined by Gina McCarthy, who was the EPA administrator during the entire second term of the Obama administration. She was an assistant EPA administrator before that. She's got a long and illustrious environmental career that goes all the way back to the Connecticut Department of the Environment. She was advisor to five different Massachusetts governors, including a guy named Romney. And uh, she is currently the CEO of the Natural Resources Defense Council, one of our great national environmental organizations. I also joined by my longtime friend and former colleague in Sacramento, Fran Pavley. Fran Pavley, a former assemblywoman and former senator, had an incredible and illustrious legislative career uh, in Sacramento. Uh, I joined her there in 2006. We were able to work together on some climate legislation, but she had already passed hugely impactful bills uh, the year before I got there, and, and actually two years before I got there. One of those is famous around the world, AB 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act. That was her bill. Maybe even more impactful, though, was a bill she passed a couple years before that uh, involving clean car standards for the state of California. That has transformed clean vehicles around this country and around the world and is, is certainly a, a great part of her legacy. Uh, she served for many years in Sacramento, but now she is at the Schwarzenegger Institute uh, at U USC. And the other thing Fran and I have in common, other than a passion for climate issues, is that we were both old college volleyball players. She played at Fresno State. Uh, so let's uh, move to our conversation with these two great expert guests. I'm going to try to set the stage for uh, a little bit of a dialogue with them. I'll provide some brief opening remarks. And then I'm going to kick it off by asking uh, Fran and Gina some questions. And the rest of our conversation will be guided by your questions, which you can start submitting now on Facebook Live. So just go ahead, fire those questions in. And my district director, Jenny Calloway, is sitting about 10 feet away from me. She's going to be receiving them. We're not screening. We're happy to cover as many of those questions as you like. But she will read them to us when we get to that point in the dialogue. All right, so why are we having a town hall on the climate crisis? Well, first of all, I just spent the last year and a half serving on a special select committee that Speaker Pelosi created at the beginning of this conference, uh, of this Congress, rather. And uh, we were tasked with generating a report to the Congress that looked at the challenge that has been put to us really by the world's scientific community, the IPCC. They have concluded that we have to dramatically decarbonize our economy to achieve net zero carbon pollution by the year 2050, uh, and then negative emissions after that if we're going to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is critical to maintaining a livable planet. Uh, so Speaker Pelosi wanted us to apply that challenge to this country and to the whole of the economy. Now, this is something that she had done a decade previously when the Democrats controlled the, the Congress. She created a select committee that led to the introduction of probably the biggest climate bill that's ever passed a House of, of Congress, the Waxman-Markey bill. But it didn't look at the whole economy, and it didn't look at it in the context of this gauntlet that's been laid down by the world's scientists. So in some ways, our task was much broader and much more ambitious than what happened a decade prior. But that select committee model was something that the speaker felt strongly about. And we have now, as of two weeks ago, released uh, the first ever comprehensive climate action plan for, for the House of Representatives. It's the first time we've looked at the entire economy, at everything, and that's what we have to do because this climate challenge is that big. So uh, it is a report, it's not a bill. So just to put it in context, uh, the work of the, uh, the climate action plan will now be taken up by the authorizing committees in Congress, and some of that work has already started. In fact, also two weeks ago, the House passed a bill called the Moving Forward Act, a $1.5 trillion infrastructure package that reflects a lot of the recommendations and findings of our select committee and is very consistent with our 
Climate Action Plan. There is every reason to believe that the authorizing committees in Congress are going to continue building on our recommendations, uh, that the next Congress and the next president will continue doing that as well. So I think this report that's um, out very recently puts out an important policy marker, and now it's up to all of us to try to put that plan in action. So I think it is very appropriate that we're having this conversation right now. The other reason we have to have it, frankly, is that this crisis is still there. I know we're all very preoccupied by the pandemic and our national conversation on systemic racism. That's all incredibly important stuff, but the climate crisis is not going away. So um, I'm glad that we're doing this. I wanna provide just a few top lines from the Climate Action Plan, and then we'll get right into the conversation. So uh, I mentioned how this committee was formed. We spent about 14 months having hearings, and uh, as the IPCC called on us to do, the plan does in fact uh, set us on a path to achieve net zero carbon emissions in the United States by the year 2050. It has a bunch of ambitious interim targets as well, things like hitting 45% reduction from our 2010 emissions by the year 2030. And negative emissions, of course, are gonna be necessary after 2050 to hit our goal. Some sectors of the economy have specific targets. For example, we call for zero emissions in all buildings, residential and commercial, by the year 2030. Zero emissions from electricity by the year 2040. 100% zero emission vehicles in this country by the year 2035. Heavy trucks achieving zero emissions by 2040 and a complete elimination of all methane leaks in our natural gas distribution system uh, within the next decade. Net zero emissions from our public lands and our waters by the year 2040, and a series of other sector-specific targets and interim goals. Environmental justice is at the heart of this climate plan, and there's a call for um, uh, a, a recognition that EJ communities, frontline communities of color, have borne too much of the burdens of fossil fuel pollution, uh, and that we need to put them at the top of our consideration as we think about citing investments in clean energy and enforcing uh, clean air laws. Uh, there is a call for a national strategic plan for the resilience of frontline communities and vul vulnerable populations. And of course, we have to have a just transition for those who have fossil fuel jobs or are in communities that are gonna be potentially impacted by the rapid move away from fossil fuels that is necessary if we're gonna meet this challenge. Natural systems and agriculture are at the heart of this climate action plan. So uh, I'm pleased to say that it calls for the protection permanently of 30% of our lands and ocean areas by the year 2030. We know that nature is gonna need these buffers for resiliency. Uh, and they will do double duty. They're great for the ecosystem and they will help us sequester carbon. The plan calls for an immediate moratorium on any new fossil fuel development on our public lands and in the outer continental shelf. It uh, calls for natural systems helping us draw carbon out of the atmosphere through sequestration. This is something that can be done powerfully through salt marshes, forest lands, and rangelands, as well as uh, best practices in agriculture. The plan calls for carbon pricing, but more than just carbon pricing. We need to have carbon pricing in combination with a whole suite of other tools that include all sorts of standards and measures that we can get into more specifically. And the plan uh, definitely envisions dramatic growth in the economy as we put Americans back to work in good paying clean energy jobs. We call for incentivizing domestic manufacturing in clean energy. Uh, innovation and entirely new sectors that can be driven by this transition. Things like direct air capture and uh, low carbon materials. We call for the protection of union rights and prevailing wages and other provisions to make sure that this transition to clean energy means good paying jobs. And we've modeled the benefits of this climate action plan and, and the results are pretty exciting. When you add up the health and economic co-benefits of all the things that we call for, including an avoidance of 62,000 annual premature deaths from carbon pollution. So we're gonna 
provide that amazing benefit, we will provide uh, $8 trillion in health and climate benefits to this country through the year 2050, and after that, uh, an annualized benefit, very significant, that will continue on. So um, that's just a little bit of what's in the Climate Action Plan. Let me bring our guests into this conversation now uh, and ask, I'll, I'll start with Gina McCarthy, then we'll go to Fran Pavley. But Gina, uh, you have seen the Climate Action Plan. Uh, I'd like to ask, what do you think of it in general? Why is it significant? First of all, let me thank you for uh, inviting me um, to participate uh, today in the town hall. I'm excited to be here with you. I am so excited about this climate crisis plan. Um, I can't believe, honestly, after all those meetings, you guys have the energy to pull it all together. I really, I have to hand it to you. It is so comprehensive, which is one of the things that's best about it. You know, you don't leave any sector behind, any individual behind, any investment opportunity behind, or any job behind that we can actually turn around this climate crisis into an opportunity for us to build a better and brighter, more just and equitable future. And that's really what, it, at, at its heart, what it's all about. And I know that we're joined by Fran Pavley. Senator Pavley is, is one of our heroes. You know it, and I know it. Yep. You know, with her work, she sort of showed us how much individual states can do, but I think what you're showing us is what federal leadership looks like. What, when government works right, what should it look like? And I have every confidence that you have the, basically the ear of, of uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi and that she's going to be pushing these issues forward. And I'm excited that plans I'm seeing out of, out of uh, Vice President Biden for what he's going to do in the future is consistent with the direction uh, that the committee is heading. You know, it, this, this work it couldn't come at a better time, honestly. I know you were deliberate. I know the committee had many, 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 many meetings. And I know I testified a, a few mm -hmm. times as well. But, you know, we're, we're facing so many crises in this nation right now. You know, we're grappling with COVID-19, an epidemic of systemic racism. We're talking about uh, a record unemployment and a, and a global climate crisis. You know, I'm so happy to have you lift all of that up and say, you know what? We are facing challenges, but we can fix it because the challenges and the solutions that we have on climate change are not just fixable, but they will benefit all of those issues if we're smart enough. Yeah. And I think the committee showed that we can be smart enough. We're the United States of America. <laughs> we have to tackle this. And I honestly know that there is no challenge that is too big for us to solve and, and make no mistake. You know, we're gonna use this as a, as a path forward to tell us about all the many ways in which we can turn this climate crisis around and turn it in a real opportunity for people to be healthier today. You mentioned all the ways in which this is going to protect people now and in the future, but also grow the jobs of the future. They matter to everybody. States like California have thousands of people working in clean energy. Across the country, you have 3.4 million people who are working in clean energy now. A considerable number of them have lost their jobs, and it's time for us to take the stimulus dollars and spend it in a way that's leaning us towards the future. And this provides us a path to do that. So I am really just excited about it because I know that, that it also addresses issues of equity and justice at its core, as it should, and in many ways that the many communities have been left behind. Yeah. Many people were really surprised by the fact that, that black communities were experiencing uh, COVID-19 mortalities at a rate that others wouldn't. But if you've been in the environmental movement, you know that pollution always hits people of color first. Pollution always hits the poor. And so we are dealing with, with a number of problems, but they all come together to tell us that we have to change uh, the way in which we're operating. We have to look at these things as an intersect and move forward as best we can. So I see this not just as a blueprint, but as a call to action. 
basically you're giving us a life preserver at a time when most of us feel like we're drowning. And now I know we can use this kind of approach that is comprehensive, that is systemic, that is hopeful, that is growing jobs, that is making people healthier, that is giving my children and grandchildren a brighter world to guide the path forward. And I think it's now or never, folks, this climate crisis isn't going away, and the longer we wait, the more difficult it becomes. So I am hugely excited uh, to be able to, to be here with you and congratulate you and all the other members and, and share Caster for doing such an amazing job. So thanks very much. Well, thanks. I, I love the way you put that. And I, I agree that this plan is not only responsive just to the climate crisis, but it can help us respond to the economic fallout of this pandemic. It can help us respond to the systemic injustices and uh, social justice challenges that we all want to face as well. Um, while I turn to Fran Pavley and ask for her thoughts about this plan and this moment, Maybe I can ask my staff to go ahead and post a link to the 500-page climate action plan for anybody who wants to read it. Uh, you're, if you're watching this, you're on Facebook Live, so maybe my staff can just post a link. And those of you who want to read the 500-plus page report, uh, we'll have that there for you. So, Senator Pavley, uh, your turn. What, what do you think uh, of the significance of this plan, and, and what can we do with it? Well, thank you and your whole team for spending the time on doing this. And uh, um, I'm a very optimistic person. And I think uh, next year is going to be a brand new year and a brand new start. And your uh, hundreds, I didn't count them all. I read the summary version with all the pillars yeah. and the talking points. But um, your the breadth of the policies that touched into environmental justice which when we started out was something we knew about, but it now we're a lot more knowledgeable. And there, everyone is engaged now in bringing up all sectors of the society. And it is a multi-sector problem and challenge. We didn't talk so much 20 years ago about adaptation. Now you have also the responsibility of worrying about mitigation and reducing emissions, but also adapting to climate change at rates that I didn't even see coming 20 years ago. We knew there was gonna be sea level rise and volatile weather patterns and earlier melt of the snowpack and long periods of drought and the list goes on and on and the health impacts and extreme temperatures. We knew that, but I thought, frankly, it was maybe 50 years from now. But we've accelerated the pace. The United States is not doing its fair share. Uh, thank you for allowing those of you who have defended us in states to move forward and not preempt our ability to protect the health and safety of the people we represent in our states. And thank you to local governments and many activists probably who are listening to your, um, your show right now or your um, presentations right now. All really important. So we have a big job ahead. And so let us know how we can collectively help but I wanted to just sort of go back in time a little bit. It, you didn't mention, Jared, my secret to success in the legislature. I taught middle school for oh, 29 years. Oh, of course, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was a history teacher. So uh, I actually could communicate with people on a very uh, a good level as far as making sure people understand things. So one thing we did back then is had Union of Concerned Science scientists write in-depth reports in our state alone what would be the impacts for science change, uh, excuse me, and climate change, so that I could go to a people in a district that doesn't understand or doesn't relate to global problems because they are representing people that have real problems, day-to-day -day problems. They yeah. can't pay their rent. They're looking for a job. So making it relevant and in California, as you know, probably the most relevant aspect that people care about relating to time, climate change, maybe depending upon where you live, is related to air pollution and health impacts. Mm -hmm. If you live in the Central Valley, places like Fresno, one out of every five kids carry an inhaler to school because they're asthmatic. Well, these warmer temperatures, longer nighttime temperatures, are making the conditions worse. Um, that's a problem. I grew up. So my background story, I grew up in the Los Angeles area in the 50s and 60s, 
when smog was absolutely horrible. And the state responded by starting what was turned out to be the first Air Resources Board, started by Governor Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I like to throw that in just yep. for historic purposes. And so then the passage of the Federal Clean Air Act in 1970 came about. Who was president? Richard Nixon signed yep. that, and we're getting ready for the 50th anniversary. That was important. So the tie-in to climate change and air pollution always resonated in our state, and that's maybe not true of every state, but in every state there are specific areas of importance that are have to have your attention. And your challenge, I think, nationally is having even a broader scope of challenges and opportunities, yeah. and opportunities in how to address this. So we have sort of seen whether it was a tailpipe bill or AB 32, but by putting a cap on emissions and a required rollback with not just aspirations, but targets, enforceable targets made the difference. And I can't tell you how many business leaders told me, we're here in California today, whether it's solar companies or whatever, not in spite of your standards, but because of them. Right. We sent that market signal for investment into these new clean technologies, and with them came the jobs. We're showing 20 years later, the first bill I introduced in January of, uh, let's see, 2001, 20, almost 20 years ago, um, was the tailpipe bill. Yep. And some business voices stepped in, along with the activists, environmental activists. So. We, and healthcare providers, nurses and doctors organizations, and American Lung Association, the list goes on and on. So that's a real lesson we learn no matter what state you're in. And I have the privilege right now for working for uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who signed AB 32, yeah. also a Republican, may I add, um, that we're working with some other states who are adopting policies. There's almost like 10 states that have adopted now 100% renewable energy policy. Yeah. We started in 2002, and your challenge will be, you have to accelerate everything. We had a 20 year head start on you, and we're still trying to catch up, and we're yeah. still not going fast enough, but we're doing a better job on working at workforce transition and making sure these benefits help uh, everyone in California, and we don't leave people behind. So thank you very thank you. much for allowing me to participate in this discussion today. Absolutely. I'm from Southern California. Oh, we, we allow some Southern California participation once in a while, Fran, so <laughs> thank you. Um, let, let me drill in on one of those specific areas you, you mentioned. Um, obviously, you've, you've, you are the expert on uh, clean vehicles, and you've done more than anybody I know to uh, transform uh, the that sector, um, we're on a good glide path uh, for the electrical sector. It's it's really becoming greener all the time, but transportation uh, is critical, and it's sort of the last bastion of fossil fuel dominance. Uh, we set a goal in this plan to have 100% clean vehicles by 2035. Uh, pretty consistent with the framework we've had here in California, but. Uh, maybe even taking it to a to a higher level. Can we get there? And what what does that look like? Well, it it is a challenge, and it's all about the transition. And can we do it? Yes, we can. To quote President Obama, but yes, we can, and yes, we we should, or we must. So we're seeing that now. We're we're having a pushback right now. Unfortunately, a little bit from our friends with the automobile associations who ended up in the long term, uh, supporting our emissions reductions and making cleaner cars and a broader choice of cars for consumers. They could have, uh, yes, still drive their pickups or SUVs, but they were going to be cleaner, more energy efficient, saving them money at the pump and helping clean up the air. Um, but then it challenged them. And then, because we we're looking at fleet averages, they started building electric cars and successful at it. And who wants that? Well, not just people in California, but you're seeing global interest in this. There's a market up there, and we know there it is. So our challenge right now is to make electric cars vehicle uh, vehicles uh, available to everyone, regardless of where you live. 
There's now a push by Uber and Lyft to make all theirs electric. It's a transition. And we know that the Air Resources Board, amazing, amazing decision just a few weeks ago, all the advanced trucks, clean trucks lot, right. will be transitioning in. Now new trucks beginning in such and such a date. And when then when you uh, your car or your truck is no longer operable, then you must buy a new clean one. We're seeing that push continue. And again, again, we're sending the market signals. We have an air resources board second to us none that can enforce this and now working with local people and all communities people want this and i I'll end with one last comment this is a success story in los angeles the la metropolitan transportation authority will have all our municipal buses operating on electricity but here's the good news it wasn't just a aspirational goal mm -hmm. Uh, people went out and secured two companies, Proterra and BYD, to come into Los Angeles area because we were creating the market, and we're manufacturing those electric buses. That's so great. people are being hired to build them, and so you're getting this win-win. You're cleaning up the air, providing jobs, and we see the 100% renewable energy is attainable. It's going to be challenging in the transportation sector. We have to do it because 40% of our emissions, uh, climate emissions in California comes from mobile sources, fuel and cars. Good, appreciate that. And I know uh, Marin Transit here is, uh, is putting two of those, one, one of the each from the two companies you mentioned uh, into their fleet and uh, seeing which one performs the best. So thanks for that. Um, let's go ahead. Been, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Jo go I'm ahead, just going to weigh in just Please. a second on the on the car issue because it's something that uh, I'm uh, a, a bit familiar with on the federal level, and and I I just want your, your listeners uh, and the folks attending your town hall uh, to know that you know there there are a couple of really critical things that we have to protect. One is the California waiver. Yeah. You know, this administration is challenging that and it is it is California's right written into the law. And so we, we feel very confident that that we're going to participate. We being NRDC is very eager to make sure that that never is lost because California has been such a leader. Yeah. on air pollution, including the transportation sector and well beyond. But it's also important for people to know that there are many other states now yeah. that are looking to join California. Well, a dozen have already clean done car it, right? Program. It, that met, met over a dozen now, yeah. actually more than that. Mm -hmm. but, but that will keep continuing because one of the things I think we get caught up in, because we watch TV, we read the newspaper, and it's all depressing stories about the federal government and what's getting rolled back. Well, I want people to stop paying that much attention to the downer part and start thinking about what states like California are doing and what other states are beginning to do in cities, because it's really quite remarkable. And if you, if you sort of get away from all the focus on, on this administration and you start peeling it back, what it tells you is that everything you have put down in your plan is doable and achievable, almost all of it with existing technology. Yeah. The key issue is that if people stop sitting on the sidelines, and, and start recognizing that it's here for the taking and you should be demanding it. Who wouldn't want an electric vehicle if you don't have to go to a gas station and you don't have to make repairs of that vehicle? Have, if it, only people who have never driven it yeah. are going to say they don't want one. <laughs> and as soon as you drive it, you're going to say, I want one, right? And yeah. so I think that it's a remarkable opportunity for us to stop thinking in such boring traditional ways and start thinking about the next generation and what they want and what they need and getting excited about the opportunities that the te these technologies offer yeah. to us. We should never have to have this plan if everybody would just invest in the cheapest, best technology available, we're done. It's there. Because it exists. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and as Fran said, it's, it sends the market signal that, oh, I'm going to beat that. I'm going to get better. And all of a sudden, that's how you regulate, right, Fran? You yes, regulate that, to the extent that, that you send yeah. enough of a market signal that all of a sudden investments flow and you step back and go, whoa, 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 we did it. And uh, nobody was hurt. Yeah. Everybody was benefited. Thank you for bringing up that waiver. I try to explain that to people. California's unique. We have a special provision in the Federal Clean Air Act approved by the federal government to sort of be your laboratory for the country and experiment with reducing uh, pollution from automobiles. This is at stake. They are, it's going to the New York uh, appellate courts, yeah. I think coming up real soon. We could lose that. It would take away our ability to do that. And then we're left with whatever the federal government wants, the lowest standard. And when I talk to people, no matter where they live, Gina, and ask them, would you like uh, dirtier air and pay more money at the pump? They will say no. And, and that, that is not a unique <laughs> position for Democrats or yeah. Republicans. That's right. It is a universal issue, yeah, absolutely. which is why, you know, I've worked for six, six governors. Five of them were Republican. And I've done an awful lot in this field and nobody challenged it because none of them ever put their hand up and said, I'd like dirty air in my neighborhood, please. <laughs> it was all about, can you deliver it in a way that is going to be acceptable for people? Right. That way you're improving their lives, where you're making people healthier. I honestly think the issue of climate change has been a little bit of a disadvantage because the environmental community has talked about it as a planetary problem. When I keep telling people the planet doesn't give a damn if people are in it. People care if people are in it. It's not a planetary problem. It's a people problem. And, and people can fix this. So I, I'm just really excited. And, and, and I, there's so much that we can do together already. We just have to get out of the doldrums yeah. and say to ourselves, OK, let, let's just pick ourselves up and move forward and invest and, and find the best ways to make things happen. Uh, and we can do that. Uh, Fran and I were both around before that happened in the 50s and 60s. And God damn it, we did really well. And pardon me for swearing. That's OK. We did really well between <laughs> then and now. And none of us are going to let that go backwards. Amen. Amen. Well, let's it, talk about those price signals that you both just mentioned. Yeah. Okay. And this, this uh, gives us a segue to some of the questions we've started to get on Facebook. One of our um, viewers wrote in, quoting a, a Washington Post editorial over the weekend that criticizes uh, the climate action plan from the select committee because it mentions uh, carbon pricing, but it mentions it sort of uh, in a less than dominant way. And uh, the, the thrust of the editorial was that carbon pricing is is the best and, and most transformative thing that we can do. It should have been right up front, and we should do that maybe in lieu of some of these other things. Now, I happen to disagree with that. Uh, I don't think carbon pricing, as important as it is, and I'm for it, I don't think it's a silver bullet. I think you have to do it as part of an all of the above approach using standards and command and control regulation in, in places uh, or else you're not going to get there. But I want to invite both of you to speak to that, which is sometimes put out as a trade-off between a carbon tax and regulation. Um, do you think the plan got it right in calling for both? Did you say the Wall Street Journal? Sorry, no, the, the Washington Post. The Washington which, po the well, Washington Post. You would expect Post? the Wall Street Journal, but no, this was the Washington Post. Okay. Well, yeah. I wouldn't have expected either of them to write it. Um, uh, but but can, I, can I just say... I, Carbon pricing is not my favorite thing. Um, when, uh, it, it, it's, it can be useful, but it needs to have really good complementary policies so that all the burden doesn't go on the folks who can't handle that burden the most, which is our low-income communities and our people of color. And so, so it's challenging. But the most important thing to remember about carbon pricing is the price needs to do something to the market. And, and the oil market is not susceptible to change with a price on carbon. And the, and the, and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal know that. Yeah. So you, you, it's not the panacea. 
We have to more personalize these issues and make people's lives better, not expect that at some high level, there's a bunch of people thinking big thoughts and imposing them on us. We wanna be part of the answer and we wanna feel and touch the, the, the actual solutions. So if, if carbon price was the only thing we could do to avoid a world of sacrifice, I'd say, oh, I guess we have to do it. Let's be careful about it. But we don't have to. That's not what this is all about. It's about building houses where I save money and I save electricity and my indoor air quality is better. And I live in a place that has trees around us and playgrounds, not, not that a, a place that charges me a whole lot more taxes and calls it a day in hopes that the market's going to all of a sudden miraculously think this is right. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know, I honestly think the yellow vest movement in Paris was a really good example of a carbon price that never ever was explained to people. Like, like Fran said, you gotta talk to people about what it means for them and why it's a benefit to them. And if you just all of a sudden start doing all these fancy big federal things, you're gonna miss your ability to engage and excite people in the process as well as the outcome. Yeah, yeah I hear you. Exalting the power of carbon pricing is, is a, kind of a siren song. It's dangerous and, and may not get us there. Fran, you uh, passed the, the best climate legislation any state in the country's ever seen. It included carbon pricing in the form of cap and trade, but it included a lot more than that, too. So I assume you're in the all of the above uh, uh, framework as well. I definitely am. In fact, I applaud both what you and um, for the Secretary McCarthy have, have said about that. You need both. Just the beginning of AB 32, 80% of the reductions were from uh, developing standards, like energy efficient appliances yeah. and building standards. It, at first, everyone was concerned, boy, would the price of my refrigerator go up if you made it more energy efficient? It turns out, well, your refrigerator price maybe went up a little, but what you saved in energy costs was a lot. Yeah. And they're incredibly, uh, Energy Star logo problems today, Incredibly supportable. Cars are the same way and everything else. So 80% uh, of AB 32 were putting in standards, requiring 20 to 33% of your electricity come from clean, renewable energy, creating a market for solar and wind, which now, by the way, even that didn't start this way, is a lot less expensive than natural gas and, of course, oil. Yeah. So that is amazing, right? So 20% so was left in what was cap and trade. That was the um, market mechanism that the Air Resources Board, after a lot of research, uh, research chose, as just sort of closing the gap, providing some flexibility for those few bigger emitters that could not make the reductions and so they had to purchase some allowances yeah. or permission to promote. There are some carbon intense com companies that we haven't figured out how to help them yet. Yeah, some heavy industries and food tough. processing and yeah. things like that. So it's a combination of, but you have to have the other side um, because I'm with you just putting a 50 cent a gallon tax at the gas station. We've seen our own, yeah. own oil companies jump up and down by a dollar. It right? won't do anything. Not affect things. So, I hear you. Well, uh, your point penalize, penalizing people and uh, letting the emitters off the hook is the wrong way. Your point about the power of technology neutral performance standards uh, is very well taken, and you did that with cars. Um, I tried to do, remember when I tried to do that with light bulbs? I passed a piece of legislation that said this, to try to do to light bulbs what you did to cars, and uh, we did it. And now we have cheap and, and ubiquitous LEDs and wonderful lighting products. Um, but we've gotten a lot of partisan resistance to efficiency standards uh, that didn't used to be there. That used to be something we could do across party lines. And, and Gina, I know you've seen that, uh, that in, uh, evolution, the sort of radicalization mm -hmm. of even things like efficiency standards that used to be bipartisan. Um, what's the problem there? How can we get back to uh, having at least some things that we can do together? Well, I mean, one of the most uh, amusing hearings I ever watched on television, and thankfully wasn't one that I was 
testifying on was a, a hearing on energy efficient toilets. If you could have heard that that dialogue, you should look it up. Yeah, it was uh, it was just an amazing thing, and it did make you scratch your head and say, "What am I missing here?" You know, I, I th you know, there's a th we face a lot of challenges now in Congress. We face a lot of challenges with the fossil fuel industry, having spent a, a great deal of of their resources first denying that climate change was real and now trying to sort of support leaders who continue to want to deny it or just don't want to do anything about it. And so it's it's extremely discouraging for most people and, and for young people in particular. And so I'm spending a lot of time telling young people not to give up on democracy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really just all about all of the challenges we have with keeping money out of it, which we have lost some key issues on that and we have to get it back. But I think a lot of it is about engaging people at the, from the grassroots up to start engaging in democracy again. Get out and vote. Start demanding the kind of technologies and products and yeah. services and opportunities that you have to have in order to build a, uh, yourself a healthy and productive life. We have not been as demanding as a population as we have to be in order to be heard. And, and part of that is the challenge of just you know, getting people organized and recognizing that so many, so, with the income disparities that we have in this country. We have so many people that are struggling to put food on the table in the wealthiest nation in the world. And that ought to give the, us pause, the people who are privileged, to recognize that, that, that we have a challenge where we need to open up our opportunities to, to our you know, colleagues who, who are black, people of color, and, and, and to you know, the, the poor communities and allow their voice to be heard and set up a system where their voices can't yeah. be silenced. Yeah. So it's all about get back to the grassroots level. Our climate action <laughs> plan talks about demanding. that. Yeah, and I was our select committee was diverse and we absolutely embraced exactly what you describe as one of the core pillars of our plan. Let me invite uh, Jenny Calloway, my district director, to feed a few questions in from Facebook that we've begun to receive. Go ahead. Well, you guys are keeping excellent pace with what the questioners are asking because the last question was really asking about the people of color that are disproportionately affected. Mm -hmm. So that was perfect. Okay. Um, Jennifer Savage wants to know, given how critical and vulnerable our oceans are to climate change, what steps are being taken to protect them from the worst impacts? Yeah, so yeah, our, our oceans uh, are a big part of this. And I, I did allude to this a little bit in my opening remarks, but um, Look, it starts, I think, with we, we got to stop making it worse. So I'm really pleased that there is a complete moratorium for the entire outer continental shelf. There will be no new fossil fuel development if we put this plan into action. And, and that's a starting point. We've obviously got to go further. We've got to look at the fact that climate change is already affecting fisheries, for example. We've got shif shifting stocks from climate change. We're going to have to incorporate climate change into the way we manage commercial fisheries, other fisheries. Uh, we're going to have to have uh, points of refugia uh, throughout the ocean so that the ecosystem can heal and be resilient mm -hmm. and adapt. And so national marine sanctuaries and other protected areas are called for in this plan. I'll certainly, um, l let me also mention blue carbon. Uh, so when we talk about the oceans helping us draw down carbon and sequester, we're talking about things like uh, seagrass and salt marsh, we don't have a lot of mangrove habitat in California, but mangroves are powerful um, drawers down of carbon. And these things, these, these blue carbon resources, uh, if we can stop uh, allowing those habitats to be destroyed and start restoring them in many places, in some cases they can, they can sequester carbon even more powerfully than anything we can do on land. So the oceans are just a big part of this. They've already done incredible duty in helping delay the effects of climate change. They've absorbed a huge percentage of the global warming that would otherwise have occurred. Uh, but we're at the point now where the impacts are overwhelming, acidification and warmer temperatures driving algal blooms. So we're going to have to to think a lot more about our oceans. Let me see if, if either Gina or Fran want to add anything to uh, my long-winded response about oceans. 
you're you're the expert on oceans. I think it's your fishing background or something like that. But uh, incredibly, incredibly important issue and one that I'm grappling with that you'll have to on a national level or maybe it goes state by state. We're going to be looking at offshore wind. Yeah and how that is done and we know under the coastal act we have three miles of uh, state jurisdiction and how does it affect marine life i was on the coastal commission for several years so i'm sort of sensitive to this this discussion but it's a renewable fuel we yeah. need to get to 100 percent renewable energy so are those some trade-offs also we're looking at ventura county uh jared uh taking out an old obsolete dam called Matillaha Dam. Oh yeah. And the amount of silt backup, everyone's really mm -hmm. excited about it because it'll do two things. Replenish the beaches with all the sand and allow steelhead for the first time in decades to be able to move forward. So uh, sea level rise is important in the health of the marine species, all of that. What a big challenge. And that is a global issue. Yeah, I should have mentioned that some of that blue carbon, when you think about salt marshes, does double duty as a buffer for coastal communities uh, and resilience as we think we're about building sea level a, We're storing a lot more wetlands. Not enough, but we are, and that's incredibly important. Gina knows something about wetlands. I remember uh, the little debate about the clean water rule. Yeah, yeah, there was a little bit of a debate about that, and I think that debate's going to continue because I'm, I'm not quite sure this administration got it right. Yeah. Well, one of the, the great things about this administration is they haven't gotten much right um, when it comes to the, it, what, the rollbacks on regulations, so, so we've been pretty effective in litigating all that. But, you know, I, I think it, we have to focus more on water quality, Jared. You, you know that that's one of the reasons why infrastructure is so important. You know, we still have kids drinking lead in their water, which, which at this stage is just unconscionable. And I want it really, we have huge investment needs to ensure that everybody has access to clean drinking water. And, and, and one of the, the things I wanted to mention on oceans, that's a little bit different than how you've, you've been talking about it. But one of the things that really fundamentally bothers me is the fact that fossil fuel companies have now been um, uh, basically focusing on significantly increasing their investment in, in manuf plastics manufacturing. Oh yeah. And that's in areas of the country like yeah. where, where, where communities really desperately need jobs. Yeah. And, and it's adding to heavily contaminated areas where you have high poverty and high, high uh, communities of color. And, 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 and plastics in the ocean is just one of those issues that fundamentally is just, is just down. You don't have to do a study about it. Yeah. You have to say, what happened to us? What are we thinking? So if we expect to protect the oceans and we expect to, to have clean oceans that can hold carbon, we have to tell the fossil fuel companies that just because they're not selling as much in, in power, you know, in ge power generation, they can't start putting it all back at us in plastics. People don't realize that the reason plastics don't break down is they're made from fossil fuels. Yeah. We have to connect dots and we have to figure out that this industry is just not the horse we want to continue to ride on Amen. and work that out in a transition that's just and equitable for the people working in those areas. But we cannot allow this to continue. We have to have a much smarter way of addressing these challenges and our resources. And water is an area that you know has been very severely disinvested in for so long. And we have to get it back. Thank you. Thanks for bringing up plastics. It is also in the Climate Action Plan. We do talk about materials and recycling and all of the upstream work that needs to be done to, to just dramatically reduce our, our reliance on plastics. So I appreciate that. How about a new question, Jenny? Okay, so Gina wants to know, what about helping schools, especially high poverty schools that may have a hard time doing the matches for grants? How do you help them buy electric buses? So I think this is a, a school bus question, Fran. Do we have any incentives for it could, yeah it could be a school bus question but it's also a resiliency question i'm sure your district like mine with all the wildfires and power shutoffs and kids being sent home from schools um we 
need to really invest um, through either bonds or other sources of revenue, um, not taking money out of the classroom, but in updated HVAC systems that are woefully inadequate on air pollution issues, ability for kids to stay in their schools and use it as a community-based resource center in the event of power shutoffs or wildfires, something I think in my area, our local CCA is sort of thinking about that. And also uh, making sure uh, that there are, there's EV infrastructure at your schools. We've done that in most of the high schools. I have a local district near uh, me. It's called Oak Park School District. They're 80% off the grid. Wow, yeah. They I, I have some that are 100%. Panels, and they're saving now in energy costs $500,000 a year that goes yeah. into the general fund for classroom supplies. But the amazing place to go is Clovis High School District or Clovis Unified School District mm -hmm. outside of Fresno, completely off the grid. That's awesome, yeah. And it's just the smart way to do business. So you have to either find that seed money, join with your local utility for a startup or some businesses. Once in a while you'll find uh, uh, local residents willing to pay a little more on an assessment or a bond thing. But I think this is the future and it's certainly a great training ground for kids as well. And if we can double it in with as a climate resource center in the event of extreme heat events or power shutoffs or wildfires, it could be a win-win. Great. Thank you. Jenny? Okay. Tony wants to know, Tony Crabb wants to know, any thoughts on how to handle the orphan and failing fracking wells that are mm. currently putting large amounts of uh -huh. methane into the atmosphere? Assuming the taxpayers have to foot this bill, what are the possibilities of taxing natural gas to pay for cleanup costs or other yeah. industry cost recovery? So this is a timely question. I think there was a story in, in the New York Times just a few days ago about the collapse of all of these undercapitalized fracking companies all over the country right now. Uh, and, you know, uh, turns out they're not very good stewards and they don't keep their promises and they're leaving behind all sorts of leaking wells and infrastructure that probably uh, the public is going to have to uh, take over and fix. Now, uh, that presents all kinds of, of challenges. And I'll ask Gina McCarthy because uh, I know that at the federal level, she was very involved in these policies. It's a little different when you're talking about uh, natural gas facilities on public lands because federal law does require usually rigorous bonding and other uh, remediation commitments mm -hmm. so that you don't have just orphaned facilities. But a lot mm -hmm. of this all over Texas and the Permian is on private land. A lot of it is in states that don't have these rigorous bonding requirements. So we're going to have to tackle it. But, but I will say that in the Climate Action Plan, we talk about how as serious as that crisis is, it's kind of an opportunity because these are ready-made jobs in a lot of communities that are gonna have displacement from our transition away from fossil fuel. So we can put a lot of these out-of-work fossil fuel workers back on the job helping fix these facilities. And we just gotta look for a way to uh, have industry pick up the tap. Gina, what do you think about this? Well, you know, it's been a, 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 a real mantra um, since even the first Earth Day that polluters are supposed to pay, <laughs> not the rest of us. And and I think I, I saw the story and, and it was it had a little video so you could see the methane mm -hmm. that's being emitted. And it was really disheartening. You know, it was one of those things where you felt like going over and sticking your finger in and going, stop yep. it, you know? And, and really, the, the only thing that I've seen that's creative is what you're discussing, which is let's put people to work going right out and getting at those. The problem with fracking all over the place is it's been a lot of cowboy activity, really not big companies that have large assets that can handle a down economy like ours. So people are just abandoning them and walking away, and there is no really good system that is requiring them, like in other uh, other industry sectors, to be able to clean up after themselves. And because the Congress has taken away a lot of authority for, for an agency like EPA to go after that, like we do with Superfund, yeah. we, we sort of have our hands tied. And I know that there's some language that's being proposed in some of the bills, and, and, and I think it's discussed here, to restore that again. 
you know, we, oh, it, it's in this actually. Uh, your mm -hmm. committee recommends that we no longer be precluded from regulating yeah. the sector. But it hasn't, you know, I don't think we've really had the authority even at the federal level on federal lands to take care of this the way we should. So unfortunately, it's going to mean some cleanup. Best news we can get is there's going to be jobs associated with that. And when, when we get some strong regulation again, which we will, we'll be able to take care of the rest. That's great. Let's try to get to a few more questions. And by the way, I think we got way too much ground to cover to actually stop at five o'clock sharp. So I'm hoping I can impose a little bit more time on my two wonderful guests. And if those of you who are interested in this conversation want to stick with us, we might drift a little past five o'clock. Jenny, go ahead. I actually have, an, a, 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 for me, an eight o'clock call. So I, I apologize we'll I'm going to have to scoot off on time. But friends, right. Fran will hold it for me. Okay. Jared will owe me. <laughs> <laughs> I already do. Okay, oh, go ahead. Good. Okay. Remember that. <laughs> All right. So Andrew wants to know, why isn't nuclear power counted as clean power in that electrical power generation standard? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about how the Climate Action Plan deals with nuclear. And I did see a Facebook comment come in um, criticizing the plan for not calling for the, uh, the phase out uh, of existing nuclear. Um, we, we really struggled with this one at the, at the select committee. Some of us are not fans of nuclear power. I am not a fan of nuclear power. I don't think we need it. I don't think we have to have it. But I think the, uh, the, the consensus was uh, we're not gonna, we're gonna call for new nuclear power. We are gonna allow uh, research and innovation to continue in case folks can have technological breakthroughs that help us develop nuclear power more safely in the future. Uh, but we're also not going to call for uh, necessarily the decommissioning. I think communities and states themselves are doing that. Here in California, you can't build a new nuclear power plant. It's just not going to happen. And I don't know too many places that want new nuclear power plants. But uh, it, it is one of the tough issues that sometimes divides even people in the environmental community that want to see 100% clean energy. Where does nuclear fit into the mix? I think the good news is solar and wind have gotten so good, and grid operators like the Cal ISO, ISO have gotten so good at balancing the grid with these, you know, what used to be disparaged as variable sources, uh, that we need a lot less nuclear for sure to meet our goals. I'll invite Gina and, and Fran to chime in on nuclear, though. Well, this can be my swan song, yes. so, okay. Gina, so, and, I, and I appreciate it. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of nuclear either, I, I have to tell you, because we just haven't resolved the, so many of the challenges. And one of the difficulties now is the, the old nuclear that people want to count towards renewable, it's old. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at units that were never constructed to actually last this long, and they have to go through permitting processes that are expensive. And as a result, many of them have been given some flexibility in the market that has given them a leg up to be able to continue to run well past their due dates. Now, that, that may be okay if you keep an eye on them, but some of our facilities are leaking. Those are not the facilities you actually want to continue with, you know, leaking so you can find radionuclides in the in wastewater around there and water that they're 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 uh, near, and and others, you know, you have provided an opportunity when you're crediting nuclear, they've credited coal as well. When you create when you carve a solution for one, boom! All of a sudden, that tiny little solution that seems so reasonable opens up and it provided market benefits for old coal because we don't want them to go away either. So it's, it has become a very contentious issue. But for the most part, what I worry about most about nuclear, even the advanced, which everyone tells me I need to take a closer look at, and I will, is that people don't like it. Yeah. No, you know, it, it, it is an inherently, it, it, they have, there is a human nature gut instinct that says this thing is not it, it, it natural in my world in a way that I want to be exposed to it. And so I don't want to force people when I can entice them with things that will have real benefit to them. Yeah. So it's a tough issue. I'm with you, Jared. Yeah. And there are very varying opinions and some are very good ones. But but I just don't, cannot imagine that we're going to have, you know, uh, a community size 
nuclear facility reactor, even though they're small and everybody says they're great in, in every other neighborhood. It just doesn't sound right to me. Yeah. So having said that, I'll educate myself more on that. I'll thank you, Jared, for everything that you've done. Congratulations on the Climate Crisis Committee. Fran, you remain a superstar always and always will. It's great to spend time with you. Well, Thanks. you are too, Gina. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate that. And I'll continue to wonk out a little longer with Fran Pavley, and, and then uh, we'll thank her as well. But thanks so much for joining us. So, Perfect. Fran, uh, nuclear power, uh, you heard uh, Gina and me, and you know we'll certainly keep studying and researching, and nuclear fusion will always be 30 years away. Uh, but what are your thoughts? Um, yes, well, in California, you're right. Uh, just 20 years ago, we had three plants in operation. Um, I remember the one in Sacramento was closed oh, yeah. down. I was on the Coastal Commission when San Onofre um, was sort of phasing out, if you will. We were concerned about thermal pollution, but it was all about in California waste. What do we do with the long time waste? Where do we send it to? And now that we're trying to clean up, here's where the problem lies. Uh, San Onofre and potentially the one uh, in, on the central coast yeah. is no other state wants our waste. Nevada, no one's raising their hand. We would like the waste from your nuclear power. Yeah. So I don't think it's a long-term solution, but on the short term, um, nationally, you might have some states that that's maybe preferable existing nuclear plants to stay online, uh, to make sure you phase out coal and some of those, and then not allow new ones to be uh, built. Uh, you know, on the coast, uh, we're always concerned about the thermal pollution and the acidification of the oceans as well. So um, it hasn't been an asset to California. Yeah. All right, Jenny. Okay, John says, a good plan is good, but it's just words. Will there be bills in January? Okay, so what do we, how do we put this plan into action? So here's the good news on that, John. We've already begun to do that. Uh, I mentioned the Moving Forward Act that passed out of the House of Representatives two weeks ago. It includes a bunch of the recommendations and policies from this climate action plan. That is not an accident. We've been coordinating with the authorizing communities as we go forward. We're starting to see other bills introduced. And so I think the answer is yes. We're going to see bills passed certainly out of the House of Representatives that carry forward um, aspects of this plan. Hopefully we'll, we'll get it all covered uh, in legislation that'll you know, get parceled out to the, the different committees that have different pieces of this issue. We need to get the United States Senate uh, in on the act. We got some great climate champions over there, but uh, Mitch McConnell is not one of them. So I think we're gonna have to see how this election goes and uh, you know, the country has a chance to choose a president who's not a climate denier. And uh, we know that Vice President Biden put out a climate plan just a couple days ago that is really bold, really ambitious. And I looked at it and I saw all kinds of parallels with the climate action plan that we just released. So I'm encouraged uh, about the possibilities of putting this into action. But it's not just Congress. It's not just the president. Uh, there are parts of this plan that will need to be taken up by the private sector that'll need to be taken up by states and local governments. And Fran, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that so-called subnational contribution is so critical to, to getting us to our goal. I think it's incredibly important because that's your support, people that have I've been implementing. I think I mentioned 10 states, 100% renewable energy, but 40, 40 states have some kind of renewable standard in, in place. Some is not enforceable, but what they're proving is that the cost can be driven down so it's competitive, which keeps uh, other energy more uh, competitive as well. We're seeing in California, uh, there will be no more new natural gas plants built. Yeah. How's that for a, a big great. change? So, we have to uh, do it. We have to do it. Natural gas is not a clean fuel. It is not a climate solution. So here's the exciting thing in Ventura County. They, uh, the California Energy Commission and ISA decided 
that they did not need that facility. They were going through for updating their um, uh, one through cooling. It was an older plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, California Energy Commission made the finding that it was not needed. That's what needed to take place, that it was not needed. And they said there are enough. I don't think new plants will be built here. And it was very contentious. And you'll be living through these kinds of decisions because all the people who work there, what are they going to do about their jobs? These were good, well-paying jobs. Well, there were lawsuits. Ended up winning most of those in court. But here's where the solution came from. A battery storage company came in, bought the site, building a facility, and there's workforce transition already going on for past employees to be in this new cleaner field. And boy, do we need storage, because that's the solution for your uh, microgrids, Jared, for yeah. uh, solar storage and everything like that. So we're seeing storage maybe replacing um, natural gas, which has been considered the transitional fuel or the bridge, if you will, when the sun yeah. doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Well, I, I love it when uh, those, those synergies line up. And you, you sharing that just makes me think back to our time in the state legislature a decade plus ago. Um, so much conventional wisdom has changed so quickly on these issues. You and I were told not that long ago that California couldn't keep the lights on without all of its nuclear power plants. And now two of them are gone. The other one is, is maybe on its way out, and the lights are still on. Uh, we were told that natural gas was going to have to be a, an even bigger part of our energy portfolio to ever make this balancing of solar and, and wind and, and hydro work. And now you're seeing natural gas plants like the one you just mentioned deemed not necessary by California grid operators. So uh, are, are you as, as uh, struck as, as I am about how fast some of these canards and, and old conventional wisdoms are falling by the wayside? Um, I have been along this journey for 20 years. And what's amazing to me, yes, we're not going fast enough and we need to do more. But what's more amazing is all the people who said we couldn't do it, they have come back and admit that not only could they, they are doing extremely well in this new economy. So it is about thoughtful transitioning. And we're going to have to really work on that workforce transition, um, whether it's free community college or certificate programs or other kinds of things, because this new energy economy is going to be a key to the future. Yeah, uh, on that same point, you know, the low carbon fuel standard that was your work as part of AB 32. And there was a Texas oil company that had fought it every step of the way and then financed a state initiative to try to repeal AB 32. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Well, I was uh, on a little field trip down to New Orleans uh, a few months ago, and I visited a biorefinery that that same company has now set up a billion dollar refinery that they're now expanding and doubling in capacity because they're selling renewable diesel into California to meet your low carbon fuel standard that they fought against. They figured out a way to make money on clean fuel. Um, the Air Resources Board just had a six hour hearing yesterday. I don't know why I'm still listening to all this stuff, but working for the Schwarzenegger Institute, I get to pay attention to it still. And uh, it was on how we get to 30% of all fuels being lower carbon fuels. And the amount of business interest there was in the room was amazing. And here's one more success story. About two years ago, there was this little small uh, oil refinery down near the Long Beach area, but in a smaller city, disadvantaged community, where they put polluting things like that. And people came in uh, and bought it. They were called Alt Air. They changed their name. They came to California because we were creating market for uh, alternative fuels. They came in, bought out the oil refinery, put back in a biofuel refinery, retrained the workers, and then got a big contract from United Airlines for biofuels. That's right. They're doing it with They're restaurant with grease, right? I, I think I know that facility. Yeah. That's good stuff. I well, mean, that, that's the kind of success story, but it, it's hard. So it, the challenge is transitioning, and we know we need to move forward. And I think your biggest challenge is every state is different. Yeah. And I don't know if this is advice or not, 
but maybe it's sort of like our different cities or our different regions. What works in LA is not maybe that works in Marin, um, but to provide that flexibility um, and not um, uh, preempt uh, states or locals from meeting or exceeding what the federal government's doing. Right. Right. Well, I think we can do one last question. This is just a great conversation, uh, and I hate to end it, but we promised we would end it at some point. So let's do one last question. All right. So Patricia Rabbits from Sustainable Novato asks a great last question, and that's, please be sure to let us know what we as individuals and local activists can do to lower our carbon footprint. So well, that's a, that's a Fran Pavley question, if I've ever heard one. Fran, what can the, the good people of the 2nd Congressional District do to lower their individual carbon footprint? Boy, a lot of things. Uh, this won't, this, you can vote by mail, and that will save you from <laughs> driving to the, my <laughs> vote correctly. Might save no. our democracy, too. Go ahead. Um, yeah. No, what, I, I try to think about that every time, because you always kind of have to sort of model uh, what you're trying to do. And so um, I keep wanting to put in solar and storage so I can uh, use that kind of energy 24 seven, and that would be helpful. I have moved up and now I have a plug-in hybrid. So I'm partially there on getting to the zero electric vehicle. I still have a range anxiety uh, here. Um, taking, walking more, I mean, all those simple things, actually making sure appliances are energy efficient. And one, I tell a lot of people now, if you can and you can afford it, shifting to electrical appliances instead of relying on natural gas should be right up at the top, uh, the top of your list. And the natural gas companies are really getting aggressive in local governments now on stopping them from passing rules and laws that uh, move us towards clean renewable energy. There's a real competition in this transition. So stay engaged in your local community, uh, whether it's schools or houses of worship, uh, and thinking what your town and local area can do can really accelerate change um, throughout your city and your region. Yeah, that's good stuff, Fran. I appreciate it. I'll just add this. Um, I think get an electric car if you can. I just got my first fully all electric, and, and that range anxiety really doesn't exist now. you got new vehicles with 250 to 300 mile range, and they're just wonderful. So I'm liberated. Uh, I'm cutting the cord with fossil fuel. Uh, we can think about uh, daily choices that we make that reduce food waste. Fran mentioned natural gas. We need to really think about that too. I think the transportation side, where we're still way too dependent on fossil fuel, and then the different ways in which we use natural gas. We've got to tackle those two top priorities. Uh, solar hot water heaters work beautifully. You don't really need natural gas to heat hot water, and, and we've got the country's greatest solar hot water rebate program because of a bill that I authored when I was working with Fran Pavley in Sacramento. You should check that out. Um, and the cities uh, around California and other places that are setting new construction standards that prohibit natural gas lines into new construction, that, that is where we need to be. And I think your local uh, government leaders that are trying to put those new standards in place deserve your support. I certainly support them in that direction. Um, but that's a, that's a lot of ground we have covered. Uh, let me thank you, my dear friend, Fran Pavley. It's great to see you again. You're such a, a star, as Gina McCarthy said, and uh, I hope we can do something like this again sometime. I definitely owe you. And uh, well, In a couple of weeks. In a, oh, that's right. I'm already returning the favor. Um, yes, that's right. But uh, also thanks to everybody throughout the second district, maybe a few beyond, that have joined us for a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Take care. And I love your district, Jared. It's just gorgeous. Well, they love you, too. Come see us uh, when this crisis yeah. is over. Yep. Thanks, Thanks everybody.